Excellent. Hi, folks. My name is Ari Kalfayan, uh, and I'd like to welcome you to our panel on the fastest growing trends in MLOps. And we have a startup perspective as well as VC perspective on stage today. So thank you for coming. We're going to have a riveting discussion. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel. Maria? Hi, everyone, and thank you, Ari, for having us. I'm Maria Karivanova. I'm the co-founder and COO at Y Labs. Y Labs is an AI observability company. Uh, we help enterprises and organizations of all sizes prevent AI failures uh, and ensure model health and data health. We got our start at the Allen Institute for AI in Seattle and are Seattle based. Great. I'm, I'm Luis Sezzi, co founder and CEO at OctoML and venture partner of Modern Adventure Group. So OctoML is a machine learning deployment platform. We take your models, you know, after you train them or found a model that does what you want them to do, and then we do everything you need to do to actually get it deployed in the cloud and in, in the edge on, on any hardware. Um, and at Madrona, I know Madrona has been around for about 25, 26 years. Uh, I've been investing from companies from seed stage all the way to acceleration stage now. Uh, some focus on the Pacific Northwest, but not, not restricted to it, so. Cool, I'm Chris Van Pelt, co-founder and chief information security officer at Weights and Biases. Weights and Biases is an MLOps platform that uh, helps teams track every aspect of their uh, machine learning workflows and provides a, a rich visual UI that enables collaboration and, and sharing. I think of it as like GitHub for machine learning. Hello, I'm William Falcon. I'm the CEO and founder of Lightning AI. So who here, who here has used PyTorch Lightning? Just raise your hands, anyone? Yeah, cool, a few people. Thank you, nice to meet you guys. Um, so PyTorch Lightning lets you build deep learning models and lets you scale them, right? Which is uh, very hard to do when you're going beyond just a solo developer. And, um, and PyTorch Lightning now lets you build Lightning apps. So Lightning apps are basically like React apps for the cloud, right? They're distributed ML apps. So you can basically have a single person do the work of like 50 ML engineers um, where you can you know, mix and match the best in class tools like OctoML for inference and weights and biases for management and you know, feature stores and all that stuff. So it solves the whole end to end life cycle problem um, doing like an operating system approach to it, right? So it's really lightening up. Um, yeah, so thank you. Hi everyone, I'm George Matthew. I'm Managing Director at Insight Partners. Um, Insight's a multi-stage venture capital growth equity firm with a current fund about 20 billion. And we're all long on all things related to, to data, analytics, ML, AI, which is an area that I've been pretty much focused on most of my investment and my operating career. And uh, we have been pretty involved with most everyone on this panel here <laughs> and uh, made a few investments uh, in the space and predominantly leading with a thesis in MLOps and next generation modern data stack. Cool, I'll put this down. And my name is Ari Kalfayan. I'm on the startup BD team here at AWS. Uh, I lead our early stage AIML practice, helping all the AIML founders get off the ground, leverage our tech, and go to market. Uh, prior to joining AWS, I was also on the founding team of Weights and Biases, so got to work with Chris, and these are all my friends, which is really fun. So we're going to have a fun panel, um, and I just want to invite you to, to learn from these folks. They're super distinguished. I can't have a conversation with, the, with them without learning something new. Uh, so tune in, and we're going to get started here. So if you ask 10 people, like, what is MLOps? I would probably get 10 different answers from people in the audience. So let's start with like, what is MLOps and how is it different than DevOps? And let's just open it up to everyone and let's get started. Who wants to go first? George, why don't you go? I mean, for me, what, I, what I've seen with the, with the sort of movement towards machine learning operations MLOps is this sort of real need to get a pipeline in place all the way from the analytical data prep into the feature store, feature engineering, as well as the experiment tracking, hyperparameter tuning, and getting course models into production and scale. And that pipeline is one that has been historically kind of difficult to do. And so a lot of the thinking that's occurred, particularly in DevOps, is now being sort of thought again in the, the movement towards a machine learning ops, ML ops world. And as we started to look at how this space was evolving, it was necessary to look at sort of the best of breed experiences in each one of the key areas of machine learning ops. And now we're starting to see that emerge as well as, as Will indicated effectively a way to orchestrate that over time. And so, so that's where I see the, the sort of current state of ML ops that'll continue to evolve on a almost sort of week to week, month to month basis. 
close if you can build on that. Yeah. So um, you know, if I think of the flow from data all the way to a deployed model, actually adding adding value to to a business, right? I, I the way I see it is that the part from data to a trained model clearly needs needs a name, you know. So because it's, it's different than doing the data management we've been doing, and then you know how we've done with database analytics in the past and so on. But from that point on, I think it sh there should be no distinction from, from DevOps, to be honest. Like, you know, the reason that I think we, there, there's some, some tendency to go and build something that we want to give it a name that's that different than DevOps is because machine learning models today cannot be treated as if you were in any other piece of software, right? So there's really a deep dependencies on the hardware that you deploy it on, if it's GPU A or GPU B, or if it's different CPU, they have to think differently because the system software is different. And um, you also have, you know, a large amount of dependencies that you typically don't have in other pieces of software. So we believe here that, you know, and I personally believe that if you uh, find a way of actually treating machine learning models as if you were any other piece of software that you can, that's portable and it's, you know, high dependence free and so on, you should be able to use your existing DevOps people and infrastructure to deploy your machine learning models, right? So um, I think that taking that view will probably open the aperture of who the target audience should be uh, for deploying machine learning models. So. Uh, I guess the one thing I would add is when I think of DevOps, <clears throat> even that term is a bit muddled. They're hard to That's really fair. define what it is. Uh, but one of the, the big pieces of DevOps originally was to empower the developers to actually deploy their, their code, get it out onto machines somewhere. Um, and I think there's, there's a lot of similarity around that specific aspect of the developer workflow with MLOps, right? I think a lot of these tools in the space are really just trying to make it easier for the, the engineers, the developers, to, to actually get their stuff done. Mm -hmm. So to, to provision all of this, often hard to provision compute with custom accelerators or all this stuff um, in, in the AWS cloud, uh, ultimately to just make their, their jobs better, right? Them able to, to move faster and, and create uh, better models. The one, uh, one thing I want to add is, and, and actually why I disagree with Luis a little bit is, while you know, using DevOps, traditional DevOps tools and techniques and processes to deploy a model in production, 100% let's do it because that means there will be more models uh, in production powering various intelligent applications and so forth. Um, fundamentally, data is quite different from software because it has completely different qualities. For example, data cardinality and, and so forth. So the tools that were developed for software engineers to deal with code and to deploy code are not the same tools that data scientists and machine learning engineers need. And so we, we need a whole new paradigm of tools to be specifically optimized for uh, data. And that's, that's kind of the, the group, the grouping of tooling that we call um, MLOps or machine, learn, machine learning operations and also the culture and processes that a lot of companies uh, deploy. So uh, they're interrelated, but different because of how different data is from code. Same thing, but different, right? So exactly, it's, uh, exactly. <laughs> it's a meme, by the way. So uh, I'll just add that I, what you just told me makes sense, but I still see this as the front end. Front end, like how do you actually debug you know, a model and you with the data and the training set and creating the model. It's in the front end I was talking about once you have a model and deploying it, right? So maybe that's how we can bridge our... Well, one thing to think about in the model and deployment is that, you know, um, and I'm kind of more leaning towards where Maria is as well, which is um, the model isn't static, right? And because right. the model isn't static, you just have a lot more iteration. You have a lot more loops. Mm -hmm. You have a lot more sort of feedback that comes, um, um, reasons why, you know, like PyTorch Lightning, like weights and biases has such incredible stature in the MLOP space is because you are continuously iterating. And that doesn't quite happen in, call it, modern software development. Like once things get pushed out, like, okay, you have another release that happens over time, but there isn't this sort of feedback loop that you might see in, in the world of models. And I think, I think that's probably why we're kind of seeing this sort of delineation between DevOps and, and MLOps that might sort of, you know, sort of uh, converge at some point. And probably the biggest thing that's gonna drive that convergence is like, as we shift from a world of model-centric development to data-centric data development, which we'll talk a little bit about yeah. in the panel later. But, but I think as that shift occurs, then we might see some of these more natural DevOps experiences emerge. Although, to be fair, just I promise the last point here, um, <laughs> you know, we do have CI/CD, which is extremely popular today, and one of the reasons why deploying software in the cloud is so great is because it continuously update and create new versions in a very uh, high frequency, right? So 
think this helps converge the two as well. Mm -hmm. Will, do you want to wrap us up on this question? Yeah, so I guess I have very controversial views on this. <laughs> Yay. So um, I actually think MLOps is a Band-Aid that is an intermediate step to getting to somewhere where we should be, right? And I think that MLOps evolved because um, AI came out of academia very quickly into industry and we didn't know how to handle it. So the best thing that we knew what to do was to just use DevOps. And so a bunch of DevOps people brought YAMLs and all the stuff that they were doing before, and they put it into you know, the, this model world, except uh, researchers, uh, I don't really care about a YAML, right? I don't really care about all this other stuff. And so um, I firmly believe that MLOps is kind of like giving you today all the parts to a phone, and then you know, hopefully you get to assemble a phone and maybe make a phone call in like two years, right? And I think it's really an intermediate step because we didn't know what we needed, right? It's, actually, it's probably better in a car. When cars came out, we didn't know we needed seatbelts, right? We didn't know we needed, I don't know, blinking lights. We didn't know we needed oil changes. Today, we didn't know we needed experiment management, right? And then we didn't know we needed feature stores. And we didn't know there's stuff that hasn't been built today that we don't know we need today, right? So MLOps is kind of this weird intermediate step to something that happens uh, next, and I think that you know, the way that we really think about it is what happens beyond the MLOps? What happens when you already assembled the stuff? Like you need a platform to be able to swap out the tires, to be able to swap out the, you know, the, the, the seat belts, right? Because the driver shouldn't care about the engine. They shouldn't care about what type of oil they're using either. They just want to get to the destination. And in today's world, they give you the car parts and you assemble your own car, or you have to take like a train or a bus or a plane and you have no control over it, right? Really, you need this intermediate like jet plane, basically, that is accessible to everyone. Um, and that's kind of our view. And we've really taken that view of saying, let's build, a plat let's build a platform that is driven by a framework. The framework drives the platform, not the other way around. Platforms today drive frameworks. And that's why it's clunky and, and like really hard to use, right? So I actually think it's MLOps is great, but it's kind of like last year's problems, right? I think once you move down beyond MLOps, and you have this kind of like operating system element to it, you should be thinking more about the destination and not the parts to get there, right? So this whole conversation about training versus deployment versus this, I don't think it matters. Also, model-centric versus data-centric, it doesn't matter either because to some people, it's it data-centric. Right it matters right now. Well, to some people, it matters. <laughs> if, you're, if your job is to process data, you are data-centric, 100%. If your job is to build the model, you're model-centric. If your job is to manage features, you're feature-centric. If your model is to do deployment, you're deployment centric. So there's no catch for all. It's depending on who you are and what you care about in your particular job. So I love that. We, we have plenty of time to disagree here and a lot more questions. Um, Chris, we've sat across from a lot of top ML teams and we've heard a lot from the industry. What are people getting wrong about MLOps right now? And how do you think about the build versus buy discussion when we're talking about MLOps? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, uh... The most common failure mode we see in, in big companies when it comes to MLOps is, is they say, okay, we'll build a team internally and we'll just have them like stitch together a bunch of tools. Uh, that often doesn't work for, for a few reasons. One, customers, enterprises always underestimate the kind of amount of complexity involved in actually maintaining and scaling and supporting um, tooling. And two, uh, you know, most of the time in the AI uh, part of an organization, you want to focus on the AI and the models. If you have an internal tools team, suddenly now you need a really good product development team if you want those tools to be world class and really usable by, by the end users. One of the things we, we found out early on at Weights and Biases is that our, our users the ML engineers and practitioners really appreciate a good UI. They, it's super valuable to them, and they get a lot of um, usefulness out of just uh, a UI that they can use and is pretty. And if you have an internal tools team building tools, the likelihood you're going to get something really usable and pretty is, is, is very low. Yeah, I agree with Chris. I think like every, I mean, who's here to try to build their own platform internally? Like, probably most people who still wants to continue doing that. So, a one of, of you, us. two of you, <laughs> yeah. a couple of people. Most people don't, you know, like most people got, it went like this, someone was like, oh my God, cool, ML, and they did it, and then they like use SageMaker, and they're like, okay, cool, and then they title this other stuff, and then they're like, oh God, crap, we need 10 people, and it's been like two years, and like we don't want to maintain this thing, right? And then you hire a bunch of ML engineers, 
and they're not doing ML, they're doing engineering, right? They're Kubernetes engineers, mm -hmm. stop lying. They're just, <laughs> they're literally doing Kubernetes, right? So I think that it's a problem, right? And it's, it's just happened, it, it needed to happen because we didn't have the tools for them, right? Um, it's like building your own car at home, like you probably wouldn't do that today. Maybe some of you would, but most put it, people wouldn't, right? So I think it's, it's about moving on beyond that stage. And I think I see that today where people have their own platforms and they don't, they don't like it. So basically build versus buy, if you've built it, you already decided you don't wanna do that. And if you're deciding this question, please go for it. You know, we'll talk in a year. <laughs> Plenty of people also build it and say, oh, I'm done. Or the exactly. employee leaves and the yeah. next person doesn't want to maintain it. So there are like literally two places in the world that can build their own platforms and maintain it, and that's Facebook and Google. That's it. Can I add to that point briefly? So to, to put a system software perspective on that, um, I feel like before you actually do any serious deployment today, you need to understand, you know, the model, you need to understand, you know, even the hardware, because depending on the GPU they're using, have, have to use different libraries. Um, or if you're doing a CPU, depending on which CPU model you need to use different libraries. This, to me, feels like deploying software in, like, in the mainframe era, where they had really tight coupling between hardware and software and the application. If you bought, you know, IBM hardware, you had to buy IBM operating systems, databases, and applications, but then to do any, any change that you need somebody who understands the whole thing. Like a lot of machine, real machine learning deployment today feels like that. And we're just, just now starting to peel away the model from the system software from the hardware that gives, you know, um, more, more options, but also requires, you know, a lot more specialized talents that understand software engineering and machine learning and hardware to deploy it. And this has to change, right? Because otherwise it's not gonna be sustainable, so. And like, you know, you're never going to do a better job than these guys. Like, there's no way you're going to build a better, like, you know, UI to track and manage experiments and watch logs and all, you know, and the charts and the different things. There's no way you're going to do that. You don't have the, first, you don't care that much about it. And second, you don't have the team of experts behind it. There's no way you're going to do a better in weights of biases. You're going to do model inference better than these guys, right? That's all they do. That's what they obsess in. So it's kind of like, again, buying your own car and then thinking you're going to build a better engine than Ferrari. That's not going to happen, right? <laughs> cool. So Maria, what's a data-centric approach to ML ops? To ML ops? Yeah. Well, um, George is gonna have to back me on this one, but uh, <laughs> data-centric, data uh, so the whole data-centric AI movement uh, stems from uh, how imp the importance of data in the machine learning system. So no matter how much you optimize the machine learning model to be more, and your algorithms to be more and more accurate, you can only accomplish that much accuracy if your data that you're using is, say, for example, not labeled properly or uh, not of high quality. Uh, so the data-centric AI movement uh, that was uh, started by Andrew Ng, uh, who happens to be an investor in Ylabs, um, is the whole movement around focusing on the data that powers the machine learning systems uh, and monitoring and, and observing and working with the data as it feeds through the machine learning model uh, and not just focusing on the model itself and how the model performs. And when it comes to ML ops, um, data centric um, and ML ops, the way we think about it is, uh, it's that tooling layer, again, that would enable um, the AI builder, whether it's data scientist or machine learning engineer, to successfully um, achieve the goals that they have for the ML system. So to successfully deploy, to successfully productionalize, to successfully produce business KPI, to success successfully power a self-driving car, um, using the various tools that are purpose-built for, um, for machine learning. Yeah, I think there's, there's definitely more to it. Like, um, you know, this whole data-centric versus model-centric, I think it leaves a lot of like nuances out because, so I, you know, I was doing AI research and I was working on self-supervised learning, right? So it's kind of the hotness today. Um, so I, at Facebook AI research with Jan and Cho, that's kind of what you work on, self-supervised learning. So Facebook today is leading on all the self-supervised learning. And when we started, I mean, Jan's been doing it forever, but when I started a few years ago, um, we started looking at models, uh, back then it was like SimClear, BYO, BYOL, I think it was, um, and then a few others from DeepMind. And we spent about a year and a half looking into these models, why they were doing well, right? And we ended up publishing a paper called AAVAE where we basically reduced all the stuff that they were doing to feature transforms. It came down to just the transforms on the images themselves, right? So it turns out that four or five years of self-supervised learning progress came down to SimClear, Someone at Google did a very good hyperparameter sweep because we tried at Facebook and I could not find better hyperparameters. And we tried over thousands of GPUs. They did a crazy hyperparameter switch and found the perfect transforms for images that allowed you to create a negative sample from a positive sample. 
and we could not beat that, right? And so today, basically, if you look at the rest of the work, they all use simcore transforms under the hood. You pull that set of transforms out, those models are going to drop. They're mm -hmm. going to drop to 10 percent, right? So I think that the, if, even in AI research, where you're optimizing models, you really it turns out you are mostly optimizing the data transforms, right? So that the story is the same, right? So I'm not advocating that one or the other are, are true. It's just like it, it, they mix and match depending on the use case, right? And in the research world, it turned out to be the data transforms also, right? So George, are we going to rely on synthetic data since we can't generate uh, human data for every use case? Depends on the use case, but yeah, in a lot of use cases, um, that is exactly the case. So, so right before I became an investor, I was uh, CEO of Kespri. So we were doing a lot of image video processing on, you know, uh, seven, eight petabytes of image video data coming off of drones. It actually turns out that when you need to find very specific anomalies on a specific area of field of vision, you can't necessarily generate enough training data to pull that off from a training perspective to generate a model that converges properly. And so in that case, you know, synthetic data generation forms are, are absolutely essential. So I think in a lot of ways, um, I'm starting to see synthetic data play a very important role, particularly in the sort of uh, training side of the, the overall model building experience. And even as we move to you know, sort of autoregressive, autogenerative uh, models as we speak, you're still going to see this sort of key element on synthetic data generation. I've looked at both the sort of structured and unstructured side of synthetic data gen. We actually invested into a company that was doing a lot of interesting work on the structured side of data for synthetic data generation. It's a company called Tonic, um, which is basically enabling you to just create good test beds of, of structured data. On the unstructured side, called the image video processing side of the world, th it's still a little unclear like how many different kind of you know forms and use cases you can take there and so we haven't necessarily kind of made a kind of all in bet per se on, on synthetic data generation there but nevertheless even if it's not purely investable yet um, it's an important part of how you kind of see this kind of world go from you know I think, I think Will's point is right like we're still in the world of like parts and not cars but right but we're moving from parts to subsystems at this point to cars and so at this sort of moment that we're in sort of subsystems, synthetic data generation is a key subsystem. So in, our, in the keynote this, this morning, we made a very clear case for simulation and robotics. So I feel like if you take a domain-specific approach, folks in robotics have been using synthetic data for a long time mm -hmm. by, by simulating photorealistic world, you know, and then using that to, to train behaviors. And I like, if you saw the keynote this morning, I really like, especially like the example of the Amazon box, right? They give a 3D model of Amazon, Amazon box and then synthetically generated photorealistic renderings of the box and all sorts of shapes and sizes and people step in and break in and so on to, to generate training. So this is happening to a large extent in sp domain specific. It would be interesting to see, I guess, your point, uh, George, like how that's going to extend to other, you know, to other domains, right? So. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I love this synthetic data generation thing. It's, uh, I mean, in the research world, it's been a big problem for a while, and I think people try to use scans to solve it. Um, one particular pretty like immediately applicable use case, uh, we actually partnered with NVIDIA on uh, Omniverse Replicator. Have you guys ever used that? So it's uh, this thing that's kind of come out already, I believe. Um, but anyway, so let's you simulate synthetic data on VR, right? So we have a lightning app, actually, that will be out in about a week or two. Um, that runs on AWS um, hardware that you can actually go and literally just drag and drop some assets into it. It's a UI, and then you click generate, and it generates synthetic data for the scenes, right? So it transforms the scenes a lot. This is a really hard problem. That's something NVIDIA has been working on for a long, long time to get right. But what's actually interesting is that the images that are generated don't have to be photorealistic for them to work, which is cool, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just the 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 statistics of it actually help you train the models. And so it's, uh, it's actually fascinating, even if you're not going to use it, just to check it out because mm -hmm. you can see what kind of synthetic data actually works. And it's actually not what you would expect, right? Mm -hmm. And so to your point, like today, it's, you're kind of limited, I think, to video and images. I'm, I'm not a, I haven't done text in a while. Um, I'm not sure how you'd simulate synthetic data for text, but I assume that's going to happen at some point. It's happening. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just fire up GPT-3. No. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> right. So, but you know, the, if, if it spires, who knows, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's really exciting because I don't lock a lot of um, possibilities for people. Yeah, I mean, one thing we're not talking about is synthetic data to combat bias. What are the use cases there? So it's a team at Facebook. Um, Parlay specifically, um, who is working on this, right? And 
they basically were training, well, I don't know how much I can say, but basically, they actually, they did publish a paper, so check it out. And they basically used, um, they, did, they, they took Reddit, and then Reddit is pretty negative in general, so then they created some sort of loss function that would, you, you treat it as a negative sample, actually. You say, Reddit is bad. Don't do Reddit, right? <laughs> and then by doing that, it turns out that, I forget the paper, I don't remember, it's something weighted, uh, inverse weighted something. And, um, and they were able to get models to actually behave in a better way. Um, they, but like there, were, like there was some trigger that if you said something, it would just like derail the wrong way. So it's really hard, I think, today to combat bias through attacks. I, I could, like, because humans are in the internet, you know, it's like no filters, right? It's really bad. And so I think it's one of the hardest problems. And like, I mean, those guys are pretty good, and I don't think they've solved it. Um, but yeah, it's a huge problem today. So if anyone says they've solved it, I'm not sure you can solve it today. Cool. Let's change speeds. Luis, can you automate MLOps like CICD in DevOps? Um, yeah, we, we just need to automate things that today are done by expensive engineers. But yeah, we can, right? So and also like the, I'll, I'll go closer to what we do because that ex, I say with more you know, authority, let's say, <laughs> uh, and, and experiences. Uh, again, if you look at the path today, once you have a trained model in order to produce a deployable artifact, uh, there's no fully automated path to actually produce a you know, highly performing portable um, unit that you can go and move around for different hardware, different GPUs, or even automatically from a CPU to a GPU and still make the most out of the hardware, right? Uh, by bridging that, then, you know, you can connect uh, your, where your model, you know, the repository where your model lives, and as you change it and you go and compile and buy a CI-CD integration, you know, get a uh, deployable unit um, that can just run and be, and be portable, right? So, Totally can be automated, so you can check it out. In fact, uh, sorry to put a shameless plug here, but just yesterday we, we announced our, you know, our new platform that demonstrates exactly that, you know, the process of you know, have a model as input, you know, producing a portable uh, output automatically and then let you run on any instance on any of the, the clouds, AWS included, obviously. And, um, so, um, and that's one clear example that we can do that part of MLOps, right? So I'll let all this comment in the other parts of MLOps. I mean, in some of the other parts of the MLOps, even if you can't fully automate those things, you can certainly orchestrate them. Right. And now you start to see this emergence of existing orchestration solutions that have been predominantly in the data space or some that have been effectively built for ML pipelines and tool chains um, now sort of taking center stage, right? And so mm -hmm. go down the list, right? You see what, what the, uh, the team at, at Airflow astronomer is doing. You look at what the team at Prefect, at Dagster, you know, uh, Kubeflow, there's quite a few options there. But but I think in all the, you know, options that are, are it's the, the clear sort of substrate around it is that you can see an effective way to orchestrate, you know, using predominantly, you know, a DAG-based approach to, to have a very sort of robust pipeline, a complex yet robust pipeline be, be at least orchestrated. And, and I think this ties back to the synthetic data um, a point as well, right? You can imagine from synthetic data to, you know, um, selecting a model architecture to auto ML to automatic deployment. Hopefully we're going to get to the point where humans just sit there, think what they want, you know, free of biases, and this thing just spits out the model deployable for what you want, right? So. I think one big challenge with, with ML models is, you know, in, in regular software development, we're used to like a red-green CI system that can run <laughs> right. through a set of explicit expectations about how this thing will will perform and, and with a model it's like probabilistic. So you could you could put some examples that are really important to you and say, okay, I definitely don't want these things that must be getting classified as, as abusive to, to suddenly switch when we update the model. Um, but it's it's a lot trickier to have total confidence that this like newly trained model is is gonna perform correctly in all of the, the weird edge case scenarios. Because that's why monitoring is so important, right? So mm -hmm. yeah. With the immune system, you know, if it misbehaves, you're going to shoot it down, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I would agree with George here. Like, I don't think you can, I don't think you can automate it. Uh, I don't even think you can automate software deployments. Like, I think you still need engineers doing it, but you can orchestrate it for sure. Um, I think that maybe there are a lot of complexities that come from the current set of tools. You know, 87% of models don't ever make it to production. Why? Because the status quo is broken, right? And I think that, the way that that's done is we took practices from DevOps and brought them into MLOps, and that's a DAG, right? So a DAG is really bad. A DAG is something that cannot, it's not Turing complete. You can't for loop a DAG, you can't while loop a DAG, you can't do if statements, you can't do recursion. 
it couples your hardware to your system, right? So you can't do local debugging, you can't do um, cloud debugging. You can't inspect the DAG. You, can, you can't freeze a DAG and tell you the state of the system, especially when it's multi-cloud. It's impossible to do, right? And so a lot of what we've done is exactly kind of reinvent that, right? And reimagine that whole situation. And that's why when I started saying what we do, I called it React for the cloud, because it's a reactive system, right? It means that it's fully Python written and you can actually interact with it. So the question about, well, what if the model is biased? How do you, it's really hard to monitor that. Cool, stick a React UI on there that you know, waits for someone from compliance to select the model. And when it's, they say yes, then you actually deploy the model. It's just how your iPhone works, right? Just how web apps work. They're reactive, they're waiting for your inputs. DAGs don't have those properties. So that, that fundamental paradigm is just completely broken for what we're trying to do. I think um, the other thing that's happening is that everyone wants real time, <laughs> running real time systems. So um, a lot of the, the systems are moving into streaming data and you know everyone wants to operate them, monitor them, react almost close to real time. So, um, I, I, I can talk about monitoring, right, because that's our bread and butter, but I think there is a convergence between a data ops and what a data engineer needs and wants and ML ops or DevOps, I don't know, depending on uh, which definition you use and uh, what you actually need to be successfully deploying and operating um, that machine learning model in production. That's, that's another big trend that I see, like data ops converging with ML ops. So ultimately to have the successful um, successfully deployed and operationalized um, intelligent applications or machine learning model. So everyone here is at Remars to learn about the latest and greatest. So let's go, let's talk about the future for a second. Are we at George? Are we going to have a breakthrough in AI explainability? Um, are we going to have a breakthrough in AI explainability? I think we're, we're seeing some early uh, you know, breakthroughs as we speak, right? And when you think about certain, you know, use cases where you look at, like, just understanding bias, understanding, you know, where a system is going sort of sideways sooner and faster. Like, those are actually happening already. I mean, you know, y Labs is a great example of a company that's actually helping enable some of that. And so, so I think in, in, in areas where, you know, we have, call it, an understanding of the data that we can actually, you know, build an explainability system around it faster, um, it's happening as we speak. Um, I think that the edge of explainability still is in some of the sort of image video side of the world, right? So that area, uh, I, I mean, Will probably knows the papers better than I do, but I'm sure there's some, some things that are now in the cutting edge of research that are gonna now show up into commercialization around um, particularly image and video explainability. And so I'm looking forward to that because I think there's a big company and a big business to be built there. Uh, so that's, that's sort of one, one point of view that I have. Um, and then kind of just more broadly extending the view of like where you know, the, the edge of all this is, is headed. Um, I think we kind of alluded to some of this already. Just the movement towards unsupervised deep learning is just absolutely just, just incredible. Like every mm -hmm. day you start to see, you know, we've just kind of moved beyond NLP into into computer vision and just the number of opportunities, particularly there, are quite impressive. Um, I have one of my sort of favorite companies that we actually just made an investment in um, at Insight that we just announced uh, was Jasper. And it turns out like Jasper, you can give six prompts to Jasper and it will write a perfect uh, paragraph essay level detail of what you want to talk about. And it's never been written by you know, anyone in human history before because it's been back propagated with all the plagiarism checks and it's a totally authentic piece. Um, and it just so happens to be using and underlying large language model, in this case, GPT-3, to be able to generate that content. And, you know, with a UI that's just kind of built for, you know, someone who's working day in, day out to create content, right? The business went from like zero to the first 30 plus million in a year because it just was so targeted for that use case. So I think, I think we're now starting to see that like, a uh, real interesting edge of where unsupervised deep learning can actually take us. Maria, what about observability? Observability, well, um, you know, when it comes to explainability and observability, there's often a lot of, um, I, I consider it confusion, but maybe overlap where, you know, explainability, there are 50 plus um, very good academic papers written about different explainability techniques and how to do it and when it's applicable and George talking about the video and images. Um, from an explainability perspective, 
what we have found from working with our customers is that um, it's very, very expensive still to do it at scale. Um, it's doable, but it is highly, um, it's, it's not scalable in a cost-effective way. So observability, which is the ability to see what's happening into the different parts of your system um, from the inputs to the outputs to the actual model performance, is where we think that um, companies are headed and what they, they need and what, what we do at Y Labs. Um, the, I, I guess big trend is number one, everyone needs it. Everyone's actively thinking about observability. What, what, how do I react as fast as possible uh, when something is going wrong um, in, in production and how do I give tools to my data science team so they don't spend days and hours uh, chasing a bug or debugging and doing manual work. Um, so uh, what's, what's happened uh, in that space is that uh, there are now products and systems that allow you to run it cost effectively, uh, real time, and across various different platforms. So um, kind of platform agnostic and uh, model agnost in a model agnostic way and um, using like statistical profiling and other techniques. So I'm, I'm very long on this sort of topic of observability. I think the one sort of comment I'd make on it is that it's, a, for better or for worse, you'd imagine that there's kind of a more fully integrated view of observability that cuts across models, across data, perhaps even systems, but unfortunately that is not the case. Mm -hmm. So there's like multiple forms of observability right now. And uh, there's a systems observability layer for sure that has a lot of big companies that have uh, remarkable scale, respectively speaking. There's almost another layer which has emerged, which is data observability and of course model observability, which, uh, which Maria already highlighted. But I think uh, there is uh, plenty of opportunity to build very, very big businesses in the observability market today. Luis, you had a can final ask a, comment? Can I ask a question? Yes, yeah, so I guess to, to tie these two questions between explainability and observability, uh, I've, been, you know, I've been observing the progress there, and I, and I, agree, I agree with George, you know, there's a lot of really fantastic progress happening right now, but I also think that there's a lot of progress in thinking hard about when does explainability actually matter? Like, for example, if, if you have a diagnostics uh, you know, model that has black box but got so complex, but you can have assurance with good observability and good testing that is very, very accurate. And then you have another model that's less accurate but is explainable. What would, which one do you choose for your health decisions? I mean, it depends. Right? So, so it depends on the use case. And right, so you, exactly, you, you, right, you yeah. said health, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, right, so, yeah. like, you know, look for, for, for credit uh, card fraud for health. Like, if there is some black box that happens to be hyper reliable. And exactly. it works, and it's been out there, and it just does what it does. I'd, I'd be fine. Exactly. Right? Right. So, but so I, think that's, I don't need it to be explainable. Yeah. Right? Exactly. But this is where re the regulatory process in us like right. needs needs to catch up, right? So, by the way, we've been doing engineering without you don't you don't prove you don't observe that a bridge was like actually it's all probabilistic. You know that with certain assurance, the bridge is going to stay on for a certain period of time under certain load. We we build airplanes like that. I mean, if we're going to go and restrict building models that way. I just feel like we're already starting from a point where we might be limiting unnecessarily. So just you know, like every time I see group scientists, you know, thinking about this, like, can I actually start thinking about when we actually need it? and think about other engineering disciplines where we build very complex systems that we rely on every day, you know, and think about that too. Right? So I'm going to get to a, a really interesting societal point on this one, and I'm glad you brought this up, Louis, because of the, I think. Um, you know, it, it has an impact actually, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it in a moment. Um, so when you talk about a black box, right? And, and of course, healthcare came up as a great example. Well, it actually turns out like credit card fraud is a, a anti-money laundering AML is another great example of like black box. It also turns out like mortgage lending is, right? Yeah. If you dig into the mortgage lending space, particularly in the last 20 odd years, and actually there was a great Business Week article written about this, it turns out that those black box models were actually very efficient for a certain type of person, as most of us yeah. in this sort of uh, you know, stage here. But if you happen to be African American, yeah, it changed, yeah. and you were looking to get your, your mortgage refinance, and you were in a certain part of the country, guess what? That black box model systematically discriminated you for two decades, right? And that's a fucking problem. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, Absolutely. so in that case, I, I feel right? so, yeah. that you need something yeah. that opens 100%. up those black boxes a little bit right. more and lets you understand what's happening because yeah. there's like you know societal impacts to 100%. some of the things that we have chosen to 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 you know be okay with. 
uh, in how, how models have come to fruition. I mean, when we talk to teams and I ask like top teams, do you know how your models work? And the answer is still often no, right? Like there are more tools, it is more observable, but in the end, the top researchers are still looking for MLOps to answer the question Absolutely. like, can we make models that are observable, um, unbiased uh, for the general population? I'm going to move on since we're. Yeah, but, but to be clear, observability and explainability are very different. Yes, observability agreed. always has explainability. Let's think Agreed. So people don't want lock in, right? And Chris, with weights and biases, you guys tie into a lot of different tools in the MLOps ecosystem. Do you think MLOps is going to be more interchangeable uh, moving forward? And will we see a convergence um, of modular architecture within MLOps? Uh, yeah, uh, ways of biases, we, we definitely do. I mean, we designed our, our product to be modular or interchangeable from the start. And that was in response to some other tools we saw in the market that, that um, didn't seem to be gaining as much traction or, or have as happy uh, uh, of users as, as uh, other folks we talked to. In fact, the, it was some people at Facebook with FB Learner that we were talking to early on, and they were saying like a lot of the, especially people doing the deep learning stuff, they weren't using the in-house end-to-end -end tool because it was, it was awkward. It, wasn't, it didn't uh, do what they needed it to do. So we knew the space was gonna be changing really quickly and we wanted to make a tool that was as flexible as possible um, and play nice with everyone. Like it was a, we saw it would be a, a losing battle from the start to say, okay, you got to lock into our ecosystem and do everything our way to be to be happy. Um, I think you know the buyer at an enterprise they just want to buy one piece of, of software ideally uh, because it makes their procurement process better. But I, I just don't think we're we're ever going to be at a place where there's like one piece of software that can help an entire ML ops uh, pipeline. So. Uh, it's really important that that all these tools play play well with each other, and that um, each tool is allowed to kind of shine for for what it's doing. I think you know Will's work with the the Lightning apps is a great example of of making modular software that's composable. Uh, and so much of the stuff happening in in ML is like it's shareable across all these different use cases. So having an ecosystem and a uh, a framework like that to share some of these tools, I think is. The, where it's going. Another thing I, we see is that inside the same company, there are teams using, say, Google Cloud for training, but then they will do inference on SageMaker or Azure or elsewhere. And in, inside the same company, sometimes often on the same data science teams, there's so many different tools and platforms used. And, and in a way, that team needs an abstraction layer that unites all the tools and, and, and platforms that they're using to give them um, ability to react and to operate and to talk to each other. So we um, we like the approach that, um, for example, in our space, the application performance monitoring companies like Splunk and Datadog and New Relic have taken where there's this abstraction layer on top and they have agents and integrations on top of hundreds of other systems. And that's kind of the approach uh, we found successful in the monitoring and observability space just because of um, the modularity of some systems and all the different tools that um, data scientists like to use. So Will, actually, let's go into it for a second. I mean, there are a lot of different types of tools, um, especially startups like to have open source tooling uh, and they want modular tools. Tell us a little bit more about um, the open source soft development and where you see it going for MLOps. Yeah, I mean, I think open source is why AI is what it is today, right? Across every other scientific, um, you know, I was in your science, com computational near science first, and men, you know, they, they grow like a, a mouse for, or, or like a monkey for years, and then they never want to share that data set, right? So it slows down science. And um, AI has made it move so quickly because we open source everything, right? And I think people are so scared. They're like, oh, why would you open source your stuff? Well, part of it is because we all build on each other's work, right? And it's how we all advance everything. Um, models are commodities, you know, like all that stuff is free and available to everyone. That's not where the, the magic lies. The magic lies on the data, your particular data set, right? That's really where the value is. And so <clears throat> open source is about unlocking people um, to have the ability to work together and build upon each other's works. There's no other way around it, and it's probably why AI will succeed compared to other fields as well. Um, I would be scared of software that's not open source, honestly, because you don't know what they're doing. They could be logging your stuff, right? They're not auditing. You have no idea what they're doing behind there. 
open source software, hey, if you find a bug or a thing, please submit a PR. If you think we're doing something shady, you know, go for it. Submit a PR and audit it. Like we get audits all the time and people help us fix vulnerabilities and stuff. It's amazing, right? And so, yeah, I think it's really, really the future. And, you know, kind of to tie it back to the last point, all the best tools, all the best in class tools are open source and they're going to be created in the open source, right? And it's it's just something that you cannot like build in house. You cannot do it as well as every other tool out there. So you do need this layer around it. And I think, you know, that's originally when when um, Python Shining was released in um, kind of mid 2019. That was the vision from the beginning, right? And it was if you look back at that time, um, you didn't have experiment managers embedded into frameworks that didn't exist, right? So we embedded TensorFlow into it, and then we embedded Comet with Tobiases. And suddenly people had the ability to start doing this. And then people started thinking about, oh, whoa, I can get things to work together. And then we embedded GPUs. And then we allowed people to go between GPUs and TPUs. And suddenly you started to see these things work together. And you started to see an ecosystem form and a platform form around that. And then that's what really unblocked, OK, now I can do this, and I can scale, I can deep speed, I can do you know, FSDP, and I can do inference, and I can do TensorRT and all this stuff. It's because you needed like a way to do a lot of this, right? And, and and there's no possible way that any of us are smart enough to create all the tools. Like you have to defer to world class teams that are across all these companies to do that. That's a good point on that. So uh, and we experienced that firsthand. And I completely agree with what you said. Well, and I just go one level down. If you think about system software, right? What we built with Apache TVM, honestly, could say that it's impossible to not build an open source way because the cross product of models to frameworks to hardware is just so large that you need to have a community. That's the only way to make it future proof as well because otherwise, you know, if any one entity that builds it, you know, doesn't exist anymore, right? So that doesn't, uh, does, doesn't continue. Uh, and that's the case for, honestly, everything else in system software today. Like operating systems, like I don't think there's any closed source operating system today that we use. Any other compile like LLVM and GCC completely open. Like all of this system software sector relies open source. Like it's just no other way to build it. Right, so it's just, the diversity is just so large, though. So. Yeah, and I think, you know, for me, my goal from day one has always been allow the best in class open source tools to work together really well, right? That's it, that's what we built from day one. We did it for models first, we're now doing it for the whole system, and it's really about that. Allow people to build the systems they want without really having to, it's that layer that we're talking about, the wrapping layer, right? Without having to get into any one of these things, right? Um, yeah, I don't know, it's just uh, amazing teams are doing great things. like. Uh, a lot of users will use weights and biases, right? And I think that they really like the ability to have, you know, the monitoring, the tracking, the the management, the ability to work together as teams. Um, some of the users use OctoML as well, right? So they take models and they inf they deploy them and then they optimize for the hardware. And like I would say, this is kind of one of the latest things that we discovered, right? Hardware optimization, like that just became a thing a year or two ago. Maybe you guys were there before, but the community <laughs> just discovered it recently, right? And I don't know what's next after that. Maybe you know, but I don't. <laughs> So on that point, Chris, how will ML experimentation change? Oof. <laughs> Oof. Oof. Bold <laughs> prediction uh, time. Yeah. Chris, you're uniquely qualified to answer that yeah, question. Let's go. Yeah, I have a lot of data. <laughs> no. uh, well, I mean, I think a trend that is clearly happening and will likely continue are these like massive models that uh, can then transfer some of their broad knowledge to a specific domain. So, these, we're seeing this in these large language models. Uh, we're seeing it in, in computer vision now. I think uh, more and more of the day-to-day -day building of models will be building off of these, these really big um, models that are, are built by large companies that have you know, lots and lots of money to train them, and then they're, they're kind enough to open up those weights. Uh, and I, I think there's you know, a ton of interesting new new use cases of that, of that kind of, of modeling. The good news for weights and biases is you, know, you need to keep track of all of that still. So <laughs> I think we'll be in business for a while. Um, yeah, and I mean, it's, it's always like, I've been in the ML space uh, for like north of 15 years now, and it's, it's always hard to predict what the, the future's gonna be. But it's, I mean, the last like five years have just been nuts after you know, the 10 years prior being like a winter. Um, but I think there's still steam. I think there's, there's a lot more to come. It's just such an exciting time to, to be in the space. Wow, yeah. that was good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Luis, let's go with you for a second. Will more systems become ML systems? 
Oh, well, more so, I, I think most systems are ML systems today, actually. So uh, an example, probably on Zoom or Teams, you know, most of your day, like there's machine learning running continuously to do background replacement and, you know, denoising and so on. You know, it turns out that your browser rendering things, you know, like layout today is done with, with machine learning. So your operating system is using machine learning to make scheduling decisions. Your microprocessor has branch predictors that have ML in harder to make predictions. Like there's ML everywhere today already, right? So I think the, the, the question is like, how are we gonna, you know, enable more folks to explicitly add machine learning models into a new application in an easy way, such that the broader set of developers can do that. So, uh, but again, I, I would argue that if they're ready ML systems, how do you make them even better and create you know, new end user compiling applications would be to make it easier for folks to add more explicit machine learning functionality into their applications. And do right? you think so, that looks like low code, no code? I mean, that's, that's a whole category right now. I, th I think it would be no code model creation and low code model integration. So I think I, I find it a little harder to, to see for me, maybe because I too much of a computer scientist, you know, uh, baggage here, you know, but I find it harder to see the, you know, model uh, integration to the rest of the application to be completely, um, you know, no code, but I can see being low code. Yeah, I guess I think about it like, I mean, I think Carpathia introduced software 2.0, the Frenchable software, right? So I guess, uh, you know, basically I think it's, you have to think about it like, you know, Regular CS or code 1.0 was you code if statements and you do logic through the code itself, right? Now that logic, you just use a model to do that logic for you, right? Mm -hmm. So instead of an if statement, you have like, you know, a, a sigmoid function that does zero or one, kind of the same, but there's a spectrum. So you basically just rethink how you code, except that in all the control flow stuff and all the logic, you stick a small model or somewhere in there. And that's how you, you can kind of think about ML really yeah. making those decisions, right? Just a, one quick thing. So it was interesting to see. I mean, it's interesting to, to see all these automated, you know, uh, large language model-based uh, code completion technologies coming mainstream now with Codepilot and the other one that was announced announced this morning. Right? I can see that. You know, would you call that coding? Well, you have you no know, natural language that expressed in a concise way that expands into code, and then a human observes it like, yeah, that that looks right. So uh, it's just be amazing to see the progress there. And I see that's like a really nice, maybe you can go there. I don't know if you call it, I still call that coding for the record because you have a human that expresses natural language but still, you know, trust but verify, right, so. I know the team's working on the next generation tools that are not announced and it's so cool. <laughs> I totally agree there. So I think with the current market and financial environment, the startup ecosystem's been hot, the AI environment's been very hot, the ML ops environment's been on fire, or lightning, in, the, um, <laughs> in this case. So what are we gonna see with this current environment? And I think we were talking about this, is there consolidation? How should founders be thinking about this right now? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll start with that, that first commentary. I think we're in a moment where you guys, at gals are all hearing this sort of first, second inning of the ball game for ML ops. But again, there's a statement that was made earlier. All this stuff is built upon each other, right? I mean, we've been sitting on like 15, 20 years plus of algorithmic methods that are now coming to scale and fruition. We've been sitting on data architectures that have been around for particularly the last 20 years and have made some, some significant advancements in the last sort of five. And so what I believe now is that, you know, this is just, you know, going to continue to build upon itself, and it should not necessarily change the fact that there is just greater and greater innovation that's just going to accumulate and accelerate as we go. So the funding environment is a little wonky right now, and that's because we are in the midst of the greatest uncertain period that we've seen in the last two decades, and that will also wash itself away. We'll have more certainty in the not-too-distant future, and whether that be six months or a year or two years, it doesn't matter. Like this is a decade long plus journey that we're all gonna be on. And I think I've seen this before and particularly 09 and, and, and 01, the best companies came about in these downturns. You have the most important opportunity to build the greatest companies of significance at scale when a downturn happens. So if we kind of look at this from a, a data analytics, ML, AI experience perspective, this is the moment right now that the greatest companies in the world are coming for, call it the third generation of innovation um, that's ahead of us. And for me personally, I'm incredibly long on the space. Um, we certainly put our you know, checkbooks where our mouths was on that, and uh, we'll continue to invest uh, with the best founders in the world. So one, um, so I, I completely agree. Thank you. So um, I'll add that 
first from from the higher level, like from a, just ignoring what is ML ops or not, and you know, it's definitely a moment of reflection for everyone. Like you know, it's like should you, know, you should you should more careful be more careful with resources. Should double down on your great people, double down on your great customers and and and, and partners and so on. And then it's a moment of like you should focus, right? It's a great. Uh, but now, um, in terms of MLOps specifically, I think it's a great opportunity too because one, you know, companies are going to be seeking for more efficiency. They're going to start looking for ways to add to to still, you know, take advantage of progress in AI ML, but without, you know, the, the large cost that comes with it, right? So that includes from, you know, the cost of people and being able to make, you know, automating the work uh, of folks that are pretty expensive and make, you know, better use of the ones that you have, right? So and then second, reducing cost infrastructure. Infrastructure costs are being, you know, ballooning. Now they're gonna people gonna look at it much more closely and feel like this all creates uh, opportunities for companies in, in AI ML systems in general, and specifically ML ops, right? Yeah, I mean, in 2009 when we were first at Figure Eight, Chris and I were at Figure Eight. We were sell selling seven-figure deals during the downturn. So it, it's yeah. not like sales stops. You might change messaging, right. may take a longer sales cycle, but there's definitely still opportunity there. So closing thoughts: um, 20 seconds each. What is one tidbit or lesson that people should take away from this talk? Let's start with Maria. Can I go last? You can get, okay, fine, George. <laughs> I, I would just take away that despite the fact that we are still moving from that point of parts to subsystems to cars, which is exactly the trajectory we will be on for the next decade, it's still important to learn how to work with the parts and the subsystems. And that means you know, get involved, get engaged, get focused on you know, building great tools, great products uh, in this space. There's plenty of opportunity to do great things this next decade, and there's plenty of capital to support you in doing it. Yeah, um, I guess I would say use open source software and be, you know, cautious about everything that isn't. <laughs> uh, I would say AI and ML is so cool. It is so cool, it's like magic. Uh, and it's a very exciting time to be working with it. So if you aren't playing with AI or ML, definitely do. It's everywhere. Um, and yeah, very bullish on the, on the future and, and what we'll see tomorrow. Yeah, so to uh, continue on that point, I think it's extremely exciting to see you know, the plethora of models there, they can do a lot of amazing things for you. Like models that exist you can use today because they're open and they're free. So the question is like, try to find ways of actually using it in your application. And now they're actually tools that actually make it much easier to do so and make your, intelli your application intelligent as soon as you can because otherwise they probably won't exist for much longer, so. I'd say um, if there are enterprises and companies in the room, just think about how do you empower your data science teams and how do you give them access to tools and technologies that would make them successful? And um, also, you know, help the, this ecosystem mature. We really appreciate that. So I want to thank our panelists. This was a really cool discussion. I really enjoyed it. I hope everyone in the audience enjoyed it. If you're looking to learn more about MLOps, we have this amazing MLOps white paper on a startup and VC perspective. I'll keep it up here for a second so you can take a photo and uh, download the link. Um, put together by Rob, who is not on this stage, unfortunately. I had to sub in. But I also want to thank Natalie Hurd for putting this talk together. She's sitting up here. They finally let her in. Thank you for letting her in and all the work you did. And in closing, if you'd like to speak with us, we'll actually stand right outside the doors. Um, since we didn't have a chance for question and answer, my email is right there. Natalie's email is right on the screen as well. Feel free to get in touch. And thank you very much to everyone here. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.